Okay, so there's been a lot of movement around the self-driving technology front. If you follow this space closely, you know in the United States you have companies like Waymo already operating self-driving cars in the United States in multiple cities. But there's one player in Tesla that's looking to put its self-driving technology not just in the United States, but globally. And this was hinted at from a tweet from Elon Musk on X, tweet, post, whatever you want to call it, where they're looking to roll out their full self-driving platform in Europe by the start of next year. And Larry Goldberg, who covers the Tesla space extremely closely, had a conversation with Case Rollinshop. I'm really sorry, Case. I, I butchered your name like crazy. Crazy coming from a person like me with my name. <laughs> but the reason why this conversation is so interesting is because Case works with Mr. Green, who are one of the largest EV rental companies in Europe and have over 1,000 Teslas that they are looking to one day make autonomous in their fleet. And with the news of Tesla looking to roll out FSD in Europe at the start of 2025, people like Case are digging very thoroughly through European regulations for self-driving technology. And there is a ton of interesting findings that point to Tesla potentially being able to operate a self-driving car in Europe much earlier than people think. I want to thank Larry and Case for doing this content exclusively on my channel. And without further ado, here are Larry and Case discussing this topic. That kind of triggered me to dive a little bit more into the legislation uh, again. In earlier this year, in March um, and in June, the GRVA, that's a subsidiary body of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, they have been doing a lot of effort in terms of creating a legal framework uh, for driverless systems to enter the market because it's quite different from the us where a, a lot of it is regulated not so much on the federal level but more on the state level and as elon put it famously in the us everything is legal by default and in europe everything is illegal by default um, so that means there needs to be a regulation in place before a system can uh, can get released to the public so uh, like have a commercial release and in march already some great work was done uh, the dcas legislation uh, which this post specifically uh, goes into what does dcas stand for do you know can you tell us yeah 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 that's that stands for driver control assistance systems and essentially for uh, in, in legal liability terms, it's a level two s still uh, because the driver, it's the first word of that, th those four words, the driver is still responsible. What happened is ever since the 1980s or so, uh, we've seen the advent of multiple driver assist systems. Some really basic like automatic emergency braking, um, some systems like that. And they have a very specific design use case, uh, which can be outlined very specifically, and then it will work accordingly and be uh, very safe. But those developments went on, went on, went on, went on. And especially since 2010, 2015, when uh, real driver support systems started entering the market, uh, for each and every different system a law was made or in any case like a global technical reg regulation was made but what happened is because there are so many different laws uh, unintentionally those laws will be overlapping and then you will end up with some gray zones where the one law prohibits something from the other law uh, so that hinders functionality in essence and when something hinders functionality it can actually create a very uh, unsafe uh, scenario on the highway or in any conceivable driving uh, scenario. And at the end of this month, uh, they'll be having another session. And at this session, they will be voting on the proposed amendments that they've made to the DCAS, which actually were already been made in March. And that voting session was quite positive uh, at that time. But then there was still this differentiation between driver initiated maneuvers on the one end and system initiated maneuvers at the other end. FSD beta or FSD supervised, how it's called right now, is in essence, of course, a level four, level five system, at least it, it, it intends to be. The core of this system is, of course, not driver initiated, but system initiated. So if we're going to put all this time and effort into making le legislation that still is driver initiated, yeah, what then are we doing exactly? What kind of struck me and that led me to write this post 
is that the system initiated part of it is actually pretty far uh, done already. And I think the general consensus amongst uh, legislators themselves, but also industry members and politicians, is that they need to hurry up uh, because they are going to lag behind seriously. They've even put up a task force that joins uh, twice a month. Uh, so there's some serious speed in developments. And that led me to uh, become ever more positive and also to write this post. And also, like, of course, mentioning the, the steering wheel nag. In legislation terms, they call it a hands-on request. There have now been specific technical regulations to withhold the hands-on request. So essentially eliminating the nag at least uh, to a large extent. So just to clarify, th this technical group that's meeting is the UNECE GRVA. Yep. So that's the technical group that's meeting at the UN. Is that correct? Definitely. Yeah. The GRVA is known as the Working Party on Automated and Autonomous and Connected Vehicles. There are multiple of these working groups. I believe there are eight or nine in total. And they are a subsidiary working group of a larger body that's called the WP29. And that's also known as the World Forum for uh, Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations. So when WP29 gets these recommendations from this working group, they would have to accept that in order to that to become a, a UN regulation or, or recommendation. And then once that the UN recommendation is made, what happens in Europe? How does that filter down to Europe? Well, there's a um, grand total of, I think, contracting parties to the 1958 agreement. And the 1958 agreement is a larger agreement that governs on a high level roads and traffic um, all over the world. And that's, I believe, somewhere between 80 and 90 member states. And all the different countries are contracting parties, but also the European Union as a whole is a contracting party to that agreement. If the working group finalizes its work and does does this recommendation for car initiated movements and the U, the W29 is what is the name of that group? WP, yeah, WP29. WP29. Then does that automatically mean that Europe will accept it or does Europe still have to promulgate regulations based upon what they get from WP29? It depends a little, but uh, in general, when the GRVA puts down proposal, WP29 adopts this, uh, which actually already happened earlier this year, and that was great news at the time. But then after approval by the WP29, uh, the new uh, adjusted regulations will enter into force um, for all contracting parties, actually. And then those member states, including EU member states and other member states, such as South Africa, but also Kazakhstan, for instance, and uh, Korea are also in there, they will need to adjust their national nation state level regulations. A couple of questions. What about Japan, Australia, uh, Switzerland? Um, what about those countries? And well, UK, UK, I guess, is part of that. Yeah, definitely. Like the, the 1958 agreement, that's the like the mother agreement. Uh, mm -hmm. There are, I believe, like 56. And let me look it up. Uh, we have Australia in there. We have Albania, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, mainly all European countries. Yeah. Um, Egypt, Estonia, Finland, uh, Kazakhstan, Japan as well. India as well. Iceland, um, Luxembourg. Uh, Morocco it does not include China. China is not part of this, as is the USA isn't part of it as well. Right. But they mm -hmm. do work together. So in yeah. creating these global technical regulations, all UN member states are in a joint collaborative effort, but not necessarily also a contracting party. Yeah, what I read in American publications is that NHTSA tends to align itself with the WP29 or mm -hmm. that group. And so one would think that if this 
does get promulgated, as it sounds like it's going to ha- going to be promulgated, then the U.S. will be inclined to to go in line. But, but remember that the U.S. is it's state by state by state. Mm-hmm. So even if NHTSA recommends it, that some states can still differ. So, Case, tell us the timing on this. What what's likely to happen from a timing perspective? Well, in the in the most utmost positive scenario, at the end of this month, the voting session will be very positive. It will be adopted completely, and that means entry into force from as soon as January 2025. But let's be a little bit less positive because, as you know, there can always be something that be that will be brought up right. uh, or which uh, hasn't been thought through carefully or the wording isn't correctly in that specific sentence, then it can take a little bit longer. But I think mid-2025 is not a weird uh, estimate or prediction. So in 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 summary, then, it's high. It, there's a pr- possibility that Europe will sign on early next year, mm-hmm. but almost certainly during the course of next year, we will see the advent of FSD assisted, supervised yep. in Europe. Exactly. And if it will be in the same uh, fashion or manner that we see it in the States, it will differ ever so slightly slightly from uh, what we see over there. One would think that it's going to take time for, for Tesla to train up any changes in the European environment or for European signage and so European roads. So there will be some testing cycles in Europe. Mm, that and, has already been done uh, and they're doing oh. that already uh, okay. because also one of my previous posts on X uh, you see that I uh, photograph sometimes uh, these fleet validation vehicles uh, so that's actually at the core of Tesla FSD of course right? it's a, it's a vision only system but they yeah. do of course rely on LIDAR, uh, LIDAR and mapping so they drive around um, and a lot of I believe that under NDAs of course um, Tesla yeah. employees themselves are, are driving around. Uh, I see a lot of those job listings of uh, ADAS test drivers uh, or ADAS test operators. So that leads me to believe that they're, they have already been extensively testing this in the background. Right. And there's a lot of people saying, uh, yeah, FSD can drive here because uh, the roads are smaller, the cities are smaller, and in the States, everything is bigger and you have more time. Uh, well, I call serious BS on that because I've been in the States two years ago. I've driven it over there. Uh, FSD 10.69 it was back then. So we've come a long way since then. But actually, in my opinion, most of the roads over here in Europe are way more way more clear signage. There's it's- no doubt about it. I, I, I spent three months driving in Europe. I drove, you know, from from... Amsterdam to Paris, Paris to the south of France, from the south of France through Spain, and then from the tip of Gibraltar all the way to Oslo. And I can I can attest to the fact that the European roads, by and large, are significantly better, yeah. significantly better than US roads. Exactly. Where it gets really, really hairy is in the little towns like yeah. the mountain, the, the hilltop towns, of southern Europe and and Italy um, and and Greece, you know, you get these tiny little roads. I disgraced myself by scraping <laughs> your brand new Tesla several times in those tiny. Nobody roads. heard it. Nobody <laughs> saw it. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, that's that is, I think, the only real uh, limits. And those are, of course, edge cases we're talking about. You know, because yeah. the whole added benefit of FSD, be it supervised or unsupervised, is you won't be driving that inner city every time. Yeah. Like it, it will relieve your um, attention and, and um, the effort you put into driving. So it will yeah. get the driving task a lot easier. And for that, we're so far already. And those edge cases, of course, but like FSD has had difficulties with that scenario in the yeah. beginning, but now it pulls it off. I will tell you that I think FSD would do very well in Europe, particularly, you know, if you look at Amsterdam, Amsterdam's mm-hmm. a scary, scary town to drive in because 
you've got cyclists coming at incredible speeds down those cycle cycle lanes on both on the road sometimes yeah. but also on the on the sidewalks and then you have pedestrians in in downtown amsterdam pedestrians just cross helter skelter yeah and, and then you have trams in the middle of the street so it it's incredibly busy and you know the eye can miss so easily that pedestrians suddenly going you know diagonally across the street or that cyclist dashing over but i i believe fsd would do a whole lot better in terms of attention so definitely and, and it's already doing this uh, to a lesser degree um with for example the the side repeater camera this yeah. help this helps me out a lot especially in amsterdam i agree and i am in fact a lot more relaxed in traffic because i already see on the screen in the visualization example yeah it sees so much and then with the actual camera feed uh when you put your indicator out you you can see a lot more happening so it's already working to uh, to some extent I, as long as i agree i mean i've I've, I've I've experienced it myself in in the center in the center of these cities and you know and so yeah I think it's fantastic really and to be honest like downtown Chicago where I've driven with uh, ten point sixty nine is also very busy and crowded and you have bus lanes and you have a inner city tram or metro subway uh, network and also yeah. a lot of pedestrians. And even then, two years ago, it worked pretty well, even though it made some really terrible mistakes. Uh, but if I look at the footage right now on YouTube of people driving in downtown Chicago, driving in downtown New York, it pulls it off. Yep. And it's become very assertive and safe at the same time. So I believe in capabilities, we're getting close. In summary, Case, you, you think that during the course of next year, so if I come over in summer and rent a car again, you think that I'll get true FSD? What do you mean by true FSD? T Tesla standard FSD. Yeah, FSD supervised, definitely. Maybe still with the nag when you do it in city center, uh, because as you just mentioned, it's very busy, pedestrians and cyclists coming from every direction. I'd advise everyone to at least have their hands close or on the steering wheel, even okay. though uh, this assistant system is already active, but on highways and on B roads, uh, you'll be able to experience uh, hands-off driving, FSD supervised. Yeah, definitely. So one final question for you, how are you enjoying your new Model 3? Lovely. I've, I've lent it out to my parents for uh, one and a half months, and I've been driving different cars in the meanwhile. So uh, I've driven a Model S Plaid, I've driven a Model Y Performance, some different Model 3s. But getting back in this new Model 3, the suspension is so good. The build quality is so good. And because I couldn't experience it for one and a half months, I actually missed out on, on some software updates. So when I got in the car, it felt newer again. <laughs> and I could tweak again a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm very happy with it still. If I can and may have two objections or two things that I not really like is the sound system because i have the um, the rear wheel drive so the base model sound system could be better and the range well not necessarily the range but um, uh, the performance of the vehicle so if i get a new model 3 for my wife i better get the top model right performance always yeah she drives a model 3 but she drives it very sedately <laughs> the range and uh, but the sound system is very important so yeah definitely yeah. Definitely. And if, if I crank it up to high volumes, then you feel that some components aren't uh, assembled thoroughly and you get yeah. interior rattle noises and stuff like that. But overall, I'm very happy with this car. Well, Case, okay, thanks very much. I really look forward to seeing you soon in the US. We'll go by Cybertruck to see the launch of IFT5. It's coming in November. Very late. I expected it already by now, but it's going to happen. I think Mark, Florian and myself, we, we, we thought about it and we discussed it. Um, and I think we we'll might pay a visit to the States sooner than later. So uh, let's right. try and make this a reality, uh, Larry. Well, we'll definitely have you all on. It'll be very exciting. Yeah, cool. Thanks very much, Case. Thank you too, Larry, and uh, hope to see you soon in real life.